Hello people of YouTube, Reddit, or wherever on the internet you may be watching this. I'm Captain Swag 101 and I'm here today to bring you guys an in-depth tutorial on how to import, texture, and animate the models for the 3DS Ace Attorney games. This is not a simple subject which I will be explaining here, so you will definitely need some basic computer knowledge, especially how to use both 3DS Max as well as some general idea of how to use the command prompt and how to run batch scripts from the command prompt. I will not be explaining how to do those in this video, so if you do not know how to do that, I highly suggest you look it up somewhere else and then come back once you have figured out how to do all of those things on your version of Windows. So before we get started, there's a few things you're going to need to know and a few things that you're going to need to make sure you have. First of all, you're going to need Autodesk 3DS Max. Now, personally, I use the newest version at this time, which is 3DS Max 2019. However, I have tested this on 3DS Max 2018, and I believe it should work on pretty much any relatively recent version of 3DS Max. So probably you could even use something going back as far as 2014, maybe even earlier. Something else that you'll probably want is a set of some convenient scripts that I will be linking in the description which will help make extracting, converting, and doing all of this stuff just a lot easier because some of this stuff is really irritating to do manually and one by one. So I've created a couple simple batch scripts and some other stuff that is going to help simplify this process a little bit. You will also need the MT Framework Importer Tools by Lucas Cohn, which I will also be linking to in the description. And last but certainly not least, you will need an extracted dump of whatever 3DS Ace Attorney game you wish to import the models from. I will most certainly not be linking any of that stuff in the description as it is not legal, so I'm afraid all of you will have to find your own ways of obtaining the game and the files for them. Once you have obtained the dump of the game that you want to find, you will need to extract the ROMFS portion of the game data. Again, I will not be explaining how to do that in this video as that is a topic that will take quite a while to explain and it is outside the scope of what I'm trying to demonstrate here. So if you don't know how to do that, again, I highly suggest you go looking it up. There are lots of great tutorials that explain things a lot better than I ever could. So now that we have all of the stuff that we need beforehand, Let's get started. So the first thing you'll want to do is navigate to the directory where you have your extracted ROMFS data. And you'll notice that we have a bunch of files in here, but for the most part we're going to be focusing on this one folder here called Archive. This is Ace Attorney Spirit of Justice in case you're wondering. However, this tutorial should work for pretty much any of the 3DS uh, Ace Attorney games that are actually in 3D. This will not work for any of the games like the the HD Trilogy or the HD Apollo Justice re-release. This only works for Dual Destinies, Daigyakuten Saibon 1 and 2, and Spirit of Justice. So, but it should be exactly the same procedure or nearly exactly the same procedure for all of those games. So, we're going to open up this archive folder and you'll see here that I have a ton of folders here. These folders will not be visible in your freshly dumped copy, as these are some folders that I have already extracted and unpacked uh, for the sake of speeding things up in demonstrating in this video. What you will have is all of these files ending in .arc. These are archive files, as the extension would imply, and these are something that we're going to have to extract in order to get at the model data. So. Included in the description, as I said before, will be a convenient batch script called Extract Recursive. What you want to do here is you want to open up the command prompt by making sure you click outside of any items in the window so that nothing is selected. Hold Shift and right click and then choose Open PowerShell Window here. If you're on a different version of Windows, this might say Open Command Prompt here. Either way, go ahead and click it and a command window should open up. So now, all you have to do is type dot backslash, not to be confused with forward slash. This is a forward slash, this is a backslash. This is what we want. It should be right above the enter key if you're using an English US keyboard. And then you want to type extract 
recursive dot bat press space then go to the folder where you have all of your rom fs here open up rom fs and drag the archive folder directly onto the window and then it should paste a string with the directory name right into the window then you can go ahead and hit enter and it should pop up a big long list of all the different files that it's extracting I'm not going to hit enter here because I've already extracted these folders so it would be a waste of time for me but once this process is done you should see this blank command prompt again here so once that process is done we then need to convert all of the textures so for that, we're going to use another script, which I have provided, which is called conv recursive. And in order to use this tool, we will need a program called Scarlet, which I will also be including a link to in the description. These will all be included in one big old toolkit, and they should all work just right out of the box. So much like the previous batch script, we're going to run it by typing dot backslash in the directory where the batch script is located, and then typing conv recursive dot bat then we're gonna hit space and much like before we're going to drag the archive folder into the window and then we're gonna hit enter and then this will have a big long list of files that it is converting and this may take a couple minutes depending on how fast your system is and how what kind of a storage drive you're using whether it's a solid state or a hard disk then once that's done we have one more step to perform, and that is flipping all of the textures vertically. Because for whatever reason, the format that Capcom uses for these models, all of the texture files need to be flipped vertically in order for them to appear correctly in 3ds Max. Fortunately, we once again have a script to do that for us. So we're going to type dot backslash flip recursive dot bat, hit space, and you know the drill drag the folder onto here and hit enter and wait for the process to complete this will probably take another couple of minutes and once that process is all done we can go ahead and close out of the command prompt window and then you should have a big long list of folders in your archive folder now of course you can tell here that the ones we're interested in are the ones that start with chr these are the character models so now it's time to open 3ds Max. This may take a couple minutes, depending on your system. Okay, 3ds Max has finished loading, and by default you're probably going to see a screen that looks something like this if you're on a more recent version of 3ds Max. These are the usually the versions that I use, so unfortunately I will not be able to provide much help for older versions of 3ds Max other than 2017, 2018, and 2019. So the first thing I generally like to do is I like going down to this one perspective window here. I click the little plus icon next to it and I click maximize viewport. This basically just blows up that one single window so that it fills the whole screen so that we can get a more detailed view of the model once we've imported it. Then the next thing we're going to do is we are going to open up the scripting tab and we are going to click run script. Then we're going to navigate to wherever we downloaded the MT Framework importer file. It's probably going to have the extension of .mzp. Now note that this version that I'm currently using is a slightly modified version just to rearrange a couple of the buttons to make them more convenient. Your version may look a little different and I will explain the differences when we get to them. But for now, we're going to go ahead and click open. And this window here should pop up. The first thing to know is that if this box 64-bit architecture is checked, make sure to uncheck it. So we want it to look like this. We do not want it to have this checkbox. We want to have it empty. Because if this box is checked, it will crash when we try to load the models. So the first thing we're going to want to do is make sure that this box import meshes is checked. I also like to check the box that says layer per LOD and I usually leave everything else unchecked. The one difference you will probably notice is that down here I have a button called Reset Skeleton, which will not be present in the version that you see. 
Instead, you will probably have a button generally over here in this area that says Regenerate Skeleton. They do exactly the same thing, they simply reset the model's skeleton to the default state, which is usually a T-pose if it's a character model. I simply moved it down here to make it a little bit easier to test various different animations. But now what we're going to do is we're going to click this little open folder icon up near the top of the framework importer window, and it should open a file open dialog box. And you'll want to navigate to the directory where we just extracted all of those character model archives. We're going to go to ROMFS, Archive, and for this tutorial we're going to open up Trucy's character model. Her character model is stored under the folder CHR105ANG. So we're going to open this up, then we're going to navigate to Object, Character, 105, Model, and we're going to open up the .mod file. You can either do this by selecting it once and clicking open, or by double clicking the mod file. And as soon as that's done, you may notice some activity down in this part of the window and over on this side. This means that it is currently in the process of importing the model, and this may take a minute or two depending on your system. But once it's done, the model will just, boom, appear like this in the window. So this is how you know that it's finished importing the model. As I mentioned before, it's definitely a good idea to know how to generally use 3ds Max before you really get into trying to import these models, because knowing your way around this software will definitely make this whole process a lot easier. So after we zoom out, we can click on a part of the model and hold Alt and middle click drag to rotate the camera around whatever part of the model we've selected. Now you'll notice that there is quite a bit of flickering here as we rotate around. This is called Z-fighting, and it's the result of when multiple pieces of the model are overlapping in the exact same place at the exact same time. Some of these models do this because they have different faces depending on whether you're looking at them from the front or the back, or whether you're looking at them from the inside or the outside. We'll try and take care of this in a little bit, but for now, don't worry about it. You also notice that we have some odd sort of geometric wireframe shapes over here. These are the model's bones. These are how the model is rigged and how you move the different pieces of the model around. You'll notice that they are separated into their own group and there's a little eye icon next to it. So go ahead and click that eye icon on the zero default group and that'll hide it and make it easier to work with the model and apply all of our textures. Now some of the models you'll notice are split up into multiple LOD levels because we checked this box over here. Some models have all of their outline stored in LOD1, whereas some of them store everything in LOD255. In this case, this model stores most of its stuff in LOD255, but all of the outline textures should be stored in LOD1. So now that we've gotten the basic model imported, the next thing we're going to want to do is import the textures. So you're going to want to go up here and click this icon right here. If it doesn't look like this, that's all right, but it should be in this position next to the teapot with a gear on it. And when you hover over it, it should say material editor. You can open it by clicking this button or by pressing the M key on your keyboard. Now, if the window looks like this, we're going to need to switch the material editors interface to be the compact version, because this is the slate material editor, as the title bar shows, and that's not what we want. So, head over to the modes tab, click on it, and select compact material editor. This should change the way the icon looks in this bar up here, and it should show this kind of window here. You can also feel free to right click multiple times on any part of the sets of spheres, and adjust how many samples are shown in the window. By default, I believe it shows 3 by 2 which is nice because it shows you more detail of each of the materials, but it's a little too zoomed in, and it doesn't really make it easy to access a large number of materials, which we need. So I'm going to go ahead and switch this to 6 by 4 because that is the maximum number of material slots that the editor can hold at any given point in time. So now that we've gotten the Material Editor window open, we're going to want to go back to Windows Explorer, back to our Archive folder, and we're going to want to navigate into that folder where we just extracted our model from. So we're going to go to Character 105, into these folders, into Model, 
and you'll see we have a bunch of texture files here that we recently converted. So now all you're going to do is click on one of these textures, it should be a PNG file, and drag it onto one of these spheres in the material editor and let go. And boom, you should see that it should automatically drop it into the circle there. And just repeat this process for every single texture you have here. Alright, so we've now dragged all the texture files here from this window into the material editor. But you'll notice here that this texture, which is supposed to be the tears or sweat texture, looks a little funny here. And that's because this texture is supposed to be transparent. However, by default, textures do not have transparency enabled when you drag them into the material editor. So we need to fix that. The first thing you'll want to do is go here to this little gray box next to the word diffuse. You're going to click on it and then drag this slider all the way to the right until all of these numbers say zero. This means that we've set the background or diffuse color to pure black. We need to do this in order to make sure that 3ds Max makes the texture look correct when we render it. Otherwise, it'll look a little funny. So we just take care of this now to get it out of the way. The next thing you want to do is click this small square box next to the opacity and number box. So we're going to click this, then you're going to want to scroll down all the way to the very bottom, down into this section here called sample slots. Scroll down to the bottom of this until you find the texture that has the transparent background that you want. Click on it, then click OK. I don't believe choosing instance or copy makes a difference, but I always choose instance. Now you should notice that the preview looks a little bit different, but we're not quite done yet. The next thing we're going to go to do is go down to the bitmap parameters section that shows up, and we want to change the mono channel output from RGB intensity to alpha. This will ensure that we're using the correct values for the transparency of the image. And now that that's all done, everything should be taken care of as far as that transparent texture goes. So if you decide to try and apply some of these materials onto the model at this point, you're going to notice that everything looks really dark for some reason. And that's because the 3DS Ace Attorney models don't use a normal lighting engine for illuminating the models. All of the models are actually at full brightness all the time, and the shading is actually just part of the texture. So in order to fix that, we're going to need to set all of these textures self-illumination value to 100%. This will make the textures appear as they would on the actual 3DS. So I've also created my own personal script to help take care of that. So we're going to go to run script. And the file may be called something different, but for now it's called all bright. So go ahead and run this script here. And it should set all of your material slots to be 100% self-illumination. So now that that's all taken care of, everything should be set up for us to start applying these textures to the model. So the first thing you'll probably want to get out of the way is all of the outline textures. If they're in their own LOD group, then it makes things very easy. All you have to do is go and select the top one, hold shift, select the bottom one, and it should select all of the outline meshes for you. Then all you have to do is click and drag the outline texture, if you're using an SOJ model, directly onto here. Then it's going to pop up a confirmation box and you tell it that we want to assign this to the selection. If you do not have a separate LOD group for all of the outlines, that's okay. You'll need to simply go in and apply the outline texture to all of the models that look black from the front. Alright, so right here I've pulled up Trucy's model from Dual Destinies now, just to show you guys specifically what you should try to do if your model does not have the outlines separated into their own layer. So if we look at this model, much like the Spirit of Justice model, there's a lot of stuff that just looks completely black aside from like a couple highlights around the edges. And if we rotate the model all the way around, we'll notice that yeah, pretty much from all angles, there are pieces that appear completely black. These are most likely the outlines. For instance, if we select her hat here, we'll notice that it has an ID value of 2. 
but there's also another mesh which has the same ID. So you can see that this is the this is the hat that we've clicked right here, is the upper ID2, but if we click on the lower one, you'll notice that they appear to be very similar, it's just that this other one seems to be slightly smaller. Well, this is a great way to determine that this is indeed an outline model, because it is very slightly bigger than the mesh with the same ID. So this is probably your best bet for determining whether or not something is an outline mesh or whether it's a standard one. Something else to note is that although some textures may appear completely black from one side, they may not look that way when you look at them from the other side. For instance here, this texture here looks black from one side, but is actually colored from the opposite side, because it's simply a one-sided mesh. So you can only see it from one side. And these are not outline meshes, so you want to be very careful when you're trying to determine what's an outline mesh and what isn't. So, here's how to separate these outline meshes from the rest of the stuff once you've figured out what they are. So, if we go right around here, we can click on our hat, and if we hold control, we can also click on various other meshes on the model. So we can select a bunch of the stuff that is very likely going to have outlines, which is the hands, her hair, and there are quite a few different outline meshes for her face, but we'll get to those in a minute because they're a little bit more finicky to try and deal with right away. So now that we've selected a bunch of these by holding control and clicking all of them, we can go ahead and create a new layer for them. So we're going to go up here and click this button that says create new layer, and this will automatically move all of the meshes that we've selected into the layer. And now if we want to hide them, we can simply click the little eye icon here and you'll see that, boom, they disappear from view and they are no longer obscuring the actual parts of the model that we will be applying the textures to. So you simply just gotta repeat this for the rest of her different meshes here, such as the multiple different face meshes she has. And just go ahead and select more of them, start clicking and drag them up into the new layer over here and make sure to place them on the actual name of the layer itself and not on one of the meshes that is in the layer otherwise it won't actually move them into the layer that we want so there you can see that the model has updated because it's now hiding each of these meshes as we add them to the hidden layer all right, there we go. Now we've moved all of the outline meshes into their own separate layer, and now that we've hidden it, it makes it much easier to access the rest of the model. And with that, back to the Spirit of Justice model. Also, because I'm using a Spirit of Justice model, they come with their own outline texture, because different parts of the model are given a different colored outline. However, Daigyak Tensaibon and Dual Destinies do this differently. Dual Destinies uses a pure black color and does not include an actual texture for it. So what you'll need to do is simply create a new material slot and simply change its diffuse color to pure black like we did before. So simply go here and click and drag this slider all the way until its numbers are all zero. Then you can simply apply that pure black color to all of the outlines. Now you'll notice that now that we've applied all of these colors, you'll notice the model looks pretty weird and ugly and awful. And that's because the outline textures are showing from the front as well as the back, which is not what they look like when you actually render the image for production. This is a process known as culling, and we need to enable it manually in 3ds Max if we want the model to look correct from the preview window while we're editing it. When you render the image, it will always look like it should, but it doesn't look quite right in the viewport preview. So in order to fix that, we're going to select all of the outline textures, we're going to right click, go down to display properties, and enable backface cull. So now that we've done that, we can deselect these, and if we zoom in very, very close, you can now see that the model has the proper outlines, and they're only visible from the angles that you should be able to see them from. So now that problem is solved. The next thing we're going to want to do, just to make things a little bit easier, is we're going to go ahead and click the eye icon next to all of our outline textures. 
and just to make things easier, I generally like to move all of the outline textures into their own layer or into their own group if they aren't that way already, just to make things a little simpler. So go ahead and click the eye icon here to hide the outlines. We will need to make them visible again by unchecking this when we render the image, otherwise the outline will be missing. So now all that's left to do is simply drag all of the various materials onto the model from the material editor window. And for certain objects, such as the hands, you'll notice that they all have a different ID value. So you'll notice here that starting with ID 30 is her right hand meshes, and they have multiple different meshes depending on the pose that she's doing with her hands. So if we want to apply them very quickly, we can simply select all of her hand meshes here, and then simply drag the hand mesh onto them. And now it's all applied. So simply repeat this process for every single part of the mesh, and it may take some trial and error in order to determine which parts of the model use what different textures. But once you've gotten the hang of it, it should be pretty quick to determine which parts of the model have which texture. And once again, for things like the face of the model, you can do this nice quick shortcut to make everything just a little bit faster. Alright, so we've just finished applying all of the textures to the model, and you'll notice that the model still doesn't look quite right. Still something a bit off. There's too much going on. There's a bunch of stuff that's all overlapping, and if you look very closely, you'll notice that we have a bajillion different face and mouth poses, as well as probably a bunch of different hand poses. And they're all overlapping each other, and it makes the model look really, really ugly. So how do we take care of this? Well, what I like to do is simply hiding them using the visibility toggle by clicking the eye and making the eye go away. So if you want to hide one of the various different hand poses, all you have to do is simply disable it, and then they will start showing up as dark gray. And then if you want to re-enable them, simply click on them and make the eye show back up. Again, this is all just to keep things as simple as I can while still being in-depth enough to explain how all of this stuff works. So here we're going to just go ahead and disable all of her various different face expressions here. And now we're going to hide her different tears here. Tears usually, tears and sweat, etc. all usually start around the ID 70 range. And then we have a couple lines for her nose when viewing it from different angles. We're going to go ahead and hide those as well. And we also have her various different hair models here. She has one model for her hair when she's not wearing her hat, and she has one for when she is wearing her hat. And she also actually has two separate textures for her face when she's wearing her hat or not wearing her hat. In this case, this is her face texture for when she is wearing her hat. You can see the brim of her hat is casting a shadow onto the top of her face. But if we use the alternate texture, you'll notice that that shadow goes away. So that's always something to keep in mind. There's a lot of experimentation that you need to do to make sure these models really look as good as they can. So we're going to go ahead here and disable her outside sort of non-hat hair. And we're also going to go ahead and disable most of her various different capes. And you'll notice that this part of her cape here has two different pieces that look kind of weird when you switch back and forth between them. That's because this cape has a shadow on the inside or on the underside of it, but not on the outside or the top. However, both parts, the inside and the outside of the cape, take up the same space. So they look a little weird, and they kind of clip and cause some z-fighting when we scroll back and forth. In order to take care of this, we can actually use the same process as we did for the outlines. We can go ahead, go to Display Properties, and enable Backface Call. And of course, we still have to take care of some of these other ones here, but that shouldn't take too long. So simply do this for all objects that seem to just kind of clip through each other without any rhyme or reason. Alright. 
we've now fixed all of the strange Z fighting issues by enabling back face culling. And now all we have to do is disable the various different bits and pieces that we don't really want to see. So we have a bunch of alternate capes here that we can go ahead and disable. And again, depending on what animation we load later on, these will you will need to enable and disable various different pieces of the model. So again, like I said, it requires a lot of experimentation and a lot of trial and error. But don't be discouraged. Once you get used to this stuff, it is very, very easy and very, very fast to swap this sort of stuff in and out. And of course, if you've disabled various different pieces of a normal model, make sure to also disable those respective outline models as well. Otherwise, they'll show up without their underlying model, and they'll all just look very, very strange. Another convenient thing to know is that the normal ID of a standard piece of the model usually corresponds to the same ID for its outline. So if you're looking to find the outline model for the first bit of her face up on the top, which is ID 50, you can simply go up to ID 50 in the outlines, and you'll notice that yes, this is indeed the model for her face. So that makes things a lot easier when you're trying to search around to enable or disable specific outlines. All right. So now we've re-enabled the outlines, we've hidden all of the bits of the model that we really don't care about seeing at this point. Go ahead and close the material editor window for now. And now it's time to try loading some animations. At this point, I highly recommend that you save the model in order to preserve any of the work that you may have done. And once you've done that, we're going to go back to the MT Framework Importer here. If you've closed the window since then, you will need to rerun the MT Framework Importer script in order to get the window back, and you will need to uncheck the box that says Import Meshes, and you will need to reopen the character model file from this little box up here. But make sure that the Import Meshes box is not checked if you've already imported the model once before. This will simply re-import the skeleton of the model, which is something that we need to be loaded in order to load the animations later. So, go down here to the Animation Loading box and click this folder icon. And now, navigate to the directory where the character is located. In this case, we're going to go to Spirit of Justice, ROM FS, Archive, Character 105, Ang, Object, Character 105, and now we're going to go into the Motion folder, and we're going to open up the file that ends in .lmt. We're going to open this up, and you should notice now that it says here, Current File, CHR 105. Now you're going to want to go down here to the selected ID and import all buttons, switch to selected ID, and select whatever ID you want. Usually it's a good idea to start with ID 1, and go ahead and click load. Depending on how large or how complicated the animation is, this may take several seconds. And there we go. The program has just loaded Trucy's animation ID number 1, and if we go ahead down here to the bottom of the window and click the play button, we can see that her model animates as we expect. She simply blinks and stands there, and usually the animation will loop on its own. To stop, simply click the pause button, or click the button that you hit in order to start playing it. Now here's where things get a little bit more complicated. If I go up to animation number two, and I go ahead and I click load, you'll notice that the length of the animation suddenly got very, very short, and you'll notice that now her mouth is open. If we go back to the beginning and hit play, you'll see that this is now her talking animation. However, if we go to ID number 3 and load that, things are going to look a little bit strange. You'll notice that her eyes are kind of jumping around where they probably shouldn't be, and if we continue loading more animations, Things are really only going to get worse. If we load even more, everything just starts to look a little strange. And that's because, depending on the kind of animation you're loading, you need to reset the skeleton or regenerate the skeleton before loading a new one. So in this case, if we reset the skeleton, she'll revert back to her T-pose, and now we can click load, 
and now it will load her eyes closed talking animation. But you'll notice that she's still in a T-pose, because the talking animations are what's known as a blend animation. They are one that is layered on top of whatever is currently playing. So, if we reset the model and load pose number three, this is a full animation here. It's her normal standing in place and bouncing while simply blinking. Now, if we load animation number four, this is her talking animation. And it is layered on top of the previous animation. However, if we want to load a new whole pose, we will need to reset the skeleton and then click load. Otherwise, it will attempt to layer multiple different poses on top of each other and they will cause various different conflicts and everything will just look very, very strange. So if you notice that your model is doing something unexpected or it looks very strange, odds are you've probably forgotten to reset the skeleton. And that's pretty much everything. We've been able to import a model, we've been able to texture them and adjust their various animations as well as make sure we know the difference between standard animations and blend animations. And we've gotten everything looking pretty nice. So hopefully that was all relatively easy to understand. I know that this is a fairly complicated topic and it's not always the easiest for me to explain stuff like this. So if you guys want any clarification on something that I mentioned in this video, feel free to let me know in the comments and I will try and explain what I meant as best I can. However, do keep in mind that I am definitely not an expert when it comes to 3D animation or 3DS Max, the software in particular. So I may not be able to provide a ton of help in regards to fixing various issues that you guys may have encountered. However, I really hope you guys found this info useful. And until next time, I'm Captain Swag 101, signing off. Bye.